Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to you, and welcome. Um, I want to just make one thing clear before I start, in case anybody wants to leave. Anybody who's come to actually hear about how you construct an aircraft carrier, if you come for an engineering lecture, I, would, I don't mind if you leave now, because that's not what you're going to get. Um, I, I had some issues with the publishers over the title of the book, How to Build an Aircraft Carrier, because my films, which I'll talk about a little bit, and the, and the book um, is very much about the ship's company, the men and the women, the most vital resource that the Royal Navy possess, and the, the way you make an aircraft carrier work is what I'm mostly interested in, rather than the nuts and the bolts and the rivets. Although that, the technology and the, the, the state-of-the-art technology at that is very much an important part of the arena, the theatre in which the men and women perform their duties. Uh, but it's primarily about people that I make films about and write about. Um, I'm an anthropologist by training, which means I'm mostly interested in the way communities uh, function. Uh, and uh, as Karen said, my first work as a, an active field anthropologist was in Central Africa, particularly in Sudan, uh, when I was interested in the way tribal communities were affected by civil war. And that was not just out of academic interest, it was in order to try and uh, help the application of aid following uh, the peace agreements that were signed. I then moved into filmmaking, still working very much as an anthropologist, primarily concerned about and interested in how communities tick. And mostly communities I was interested in were those facing hazardous situations, so in, in extreme parts of the world. Those people facing um, natural hazards, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, because I think those sorts of pressures upon communities really, really allow you to understand the way people function together, individually and, and particularly together. And then my interest diverted itself into the military because you, you have young people, primarily young people, learning to operate out of a sense of duty and, and actually comradeship, of course, and love even of, of each other, concern for each other in very extreme circumstances, whether it be at war on the front line in Afghanistan, where I, I went... I, I went 11 times, 11 deployments with the Royal Marines, um, and warships. Now, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, uh, my initial research and academic interest was in the tribal, the way tribes function. There is no more, nowhere more tribal than a warship. Um, it's, it's, it's got its own um, uh, rituals, it's got its own language, uh, it's got its own sense of duty, it's got a sense of comradeship, uh, and of course, the great advantage for me as an anthropologist or filmmaker is that they can't escape. They, they can't go anywhere. Uh, so I embed um, and I practice something that's called participant observation. So you, you don't, I don't just go in there and stand aside and watch or film or write. I participate uh, as far as I can as one of the ship's company. I wear uniform. I don't have a rank because I'm not part of, of the Royal Navy or the Royal Marines. So I, the great advantage to me then is that I, I adopt the rank, or I assume the rank of whoever I'm talking to. So one minute I'm a Commodore or a Captain, the next minute I'm a lowly stoker. And that's rather like a chaplain works in the Navy. They assume the rank of whoever they're talking to. And that's a huge advantage. It means I don't have to salute and say yes or no, sir, and everybody treats me as an equal. But it does mean I have to take part in everything that I'm expected to take part in, whether it's cleaning ship, or, or, or you know, taking part in man over drill exercises, or, or, and of course you've got to be ready for any eventuality. And warships are very dangerous places; they've got very sharp edges, and if things go wrong, they can go wrong very quickly indeed. Which is why the ship's company is what a ship is all about. Um, the and, and of course in the HMS Queen Elizabeth, the crew, or I shouldn't say a, ship, a ship's company of. 1,600 people, many of whom um, are going to see for the first time. They're straight out of training. Average age on HMS Queen Elizabeth, every time I've been on her, average age is 24, just 24. Um, about 10%, 13% women, and roughly 23 nationalities. 
which surprises people to hear that. Uh, roughly the same number of nationalities, actually, that Nelson had on victory, uh, as it happens. But they weren't Commonwealth citizens. Our, our, our ship's companies now, our sailors and Marines, are drawn from across the Commonwealth. But it's a very diverse, very inclusive community, which is fantastic. Um, it, it, it is a little Britain, and I think it functions really well. Uh, and we can learn lessons from the way sailors operate together on a warship. And if we could transfer that to our own society, I think we'd, we'd um, be a lot better off, frankly. Now, how did it all start? Well, I've had a passion for the Royal Navy all my life. My father was a, a fleet air arm pilot in the Second World War, his swordfish. My mother was a, a wren, as, as female sailors were called back in the day, um, leading wren. And um, so I was, when I was born, I was born into the Navy, more or less. And I was going to go into the Navy until I was about 18, but I was 18 in the swinging 60s when going into the <laughs> Navy didn't quite um, marry up to my world view at the time. Uh, so instead, I, I went on the hippie trail, grew my hair long and went on the hippie trail. Funny enough, I ended up in Afghanistan, a place, of, a place of peace and love in those days. I returned many years later to a place which was not a place of peace and love. We'll maybe talk about that later. Um, so, but then, but I had this fascination for the Navy nonetheless. And then the opportunity came in, 1990, in 1994, yes, uh, to join HMS Brilliant, a frigate going to op operate in the um, Aegean during the Yugoslavian War. First time women had gone to sea on a frontline warship uh, in, in a combat mode, locked and loaded and ready for action. Um, and I spent four months on HMS Brilliant to try again to understand the, the way a ship's company works. Um, and that's not only works in terms of going to war or going to combat or being prepared for combat, but also how they function together uh, in terms of humour and being there for each other. Uh, and it can be a very tense environment, very tense. It's a, it's, it's a very extreme lifestyle. Uh, and sometimes people are pushed to their edges and pushed to their limits, rather. And I'll talk a bit about that, because towards the end of the talk, I'm going to bring you up to date with my last... Uh, voyage on HMS Queen Elizabeth last year when we had nearly eight months at sea uh, going on her first operational deployment to the South China Sea and we were pushed to the limit um, both in terms of Russian activity in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, the, the Chinese and the Taiwan Straits um, and of course we went at a time of COVID and I'll talk about that a little bit later. You imagine what we went through during COVID here you transpose that onto an enclosed warship of 1,600 people, uh, and you might be able to imagine the issues and the pressures. Now, I am, um, so I'll, I'll fast forward to HMS Queen Elizabeth. I had heard that this vast ship was going to be built, and I was immediately interested. I thought the building of the biggest warship ever built, designed and built, for the Royal Navy in this country is going to be a compelling story to tell, to film, and to write about. And so I went up to um, Govan in near Glasgow in Scotland. Uh, my wife, who's here tonight, today, we, we both went up together, uh, absolutely convinced that there's a, a, a fantastic story to tell, to see this ship being started. Uh, Princess Royal, uh, Princess Anne, was going up to uh, lay the first steel and then beyond that, that's 2009, it's going to take nine years or so, or not quite that long, but six or seven years, I should say, until all the parts of the constituent parts of HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth, which were being built in seven shipyards all around the country, are then taken by barge and put together in Ross Ice, like a big Lego toy. And it was there assembled, and I wanted to watch this gargantuan British icon come together and emerge and be what she was destined to be. But at that time in 2009, it was all on paper. But I also knew that um, whilst the construction was going to be fascinating, it was all about people. It was about the constructors, the thousands of workers who were putting this ship together. Biggest engineering project at the time, short of the Olympic Games, the 2012 Olympic Games. 
at a cost of three and a half billion pounds. Um, sounds a lot, doesn't it? Although I would just intercede there in that the American carrier of the same sort of size uh, cost 15 billion dollars. Uh, but actually, dollar and pound is almost the same now, isn't it? Um, and that's not included in the nuclear engine. So actually, that's a pretty eye-watering price tag. We, we, we got HMS Queen Elizabeth pretty cheap. But nonetheless, three and a half billion is still a lot of money. Um, so yes, the construction was one thing, but it was the, the, the men and the women, the boys and the girls, coming together to make this warship work, which is what I was really interested in. And how to start? Well, um, first of all, I had to get a commission. I had to get, to, uh, I had get up to this point, we were paying for everything ourselves, and that's fine. It's a labor of love, but you can't make a, uh, what was the first, you know, a, program, a documentary series on, on nothing. We had, we had to get a commission, we had to get a budget. BBC, no broadcaster was interested. Nobody wanted to touch it. Why would we be interested in the building of a warship? When she goes to war, then come back and talk to us. I said, no, you don't get it. This, this is going to be a compelling, compelling story. Anyway, um, I, we filmed on our, at our own expense for a long time and had quite a lot of really great footage. And we had enough to put together a small taster film, if you like. And eventually, after a lot of cajoling, um, a lot of threat and, a, and um, a lot of frustration, we managed to secure a, com a commission with the BBC. And this was to be called Britain's Biggest Warship. Now, interestingly, this was a specialist factual um, department in the BBC who were interested mostly in technology and science. And they said, OK, Chris, uh, six-part series, six one-hours, but we're not interested in people. We just want to know how this thing works. And I said, well, you have to look elsewhere, because I thought, well, you're not going to get that with me. And so there was the first locking of horns, if you like. Um, and I thought it was going to fail. I thought all they want is to know how the turbines work, how the propellers spin, and how the phalanx anti-aircraft system works. And I was interested in those, but I was much more interested in the stokers that made the engines work, the gunners that made the phalanx systems fire. And that's, for me, how you tell a, tell a good story. Um, anyway, we got our way. We made it our, uh, the way we wanted to wanted to make it. And it must have worked because the BBC has since commissioned two more series. Uh, one of, so two have gone out and one I'm still working on, which will come out uh, just after Christmas. And that's um, going to be called Strike Carrier. And I'm going to give you, you're the first person, to, first people to see um, but a little bit of that film, uh, which I'll show at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. Um, so Luckily, because of my time with the Navy, I had quite a lot of contacts, a lot of friends, and some of them were, were, um, uh, had been asked to, to take part in the, or well, join the ship's company, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, from the beginning. So I had an in with some old and bold sailors who, who, who I knew, and they were able to introduce me. First and foremost, to Jerry Kidd, C C Captain Jerry Kidd, the first seagoing captain of HMS Queen Elizabeth, who I met for the first time in Ross Ice. In May 2016, I think it was. Um, and I thought, it's make or break. If we don't get on, this is not going to work. Luckily, he is now, I'm happy to say, one of my closest friends. Um, and, and it was only through Jerry, who then became the fleet commander, incidentally. He's now, he's now the, uh, the lieutenant governor of Jersey. Um, uh, and it's, it's only with that sort of support and that sort of understanding, and somebody brave enough and courageous enough to say, Chris, go for it. I don't, I work alone, I'm a solo operator, and I don't work with what's called minders. The, the, the MOD, the Navy, often like to put a minder on your shoulder. I, I understand why, but you can't work that way. I need to have complete, unfettered access to the sailors, whether they be lowly first time stokers or chefs or whatever, or, or, or old and bold officers. I need to be able to operate alone and without anybody watching over my shoulder. Because one thing that people don't under often understand is that when we make films about the military, in my case particularly the Royal Marines and the Navy, um, 
the MOD doesn't have any editorial control whatsoever. We have to, we have to keep editorial control to ourselves. Otherwise, it becomes a PR job. We have to have the freedom to tell the story our way. Warts and all, you might have heard that expression before. But our Uppercut Films, which is my company, I run with my wife, we have a very specific ethic, which is we, we celebrate, we don't denigrate. We look for the positive in the communities we work with. Because first of all, that's part of the trust that I establish with the people I'm filming or, write, or indeed writing about. And I'll talk about the distinction between filming and writing in a minute, because obviously we're here mostly, I think, to talk about writing. Um, but I am primarily a filmmaker, so forgive me if I, if I, I stress the filmmaking bit for the moment. Um, so, yeah, the, um, but Jerry, Jerry had the courage to say, okay, go, go and do your bit. Go and do whatever you need to do. Um, I was always open. I was always transparent. I said, if you want to see anything I filmed, just come along to, to, to my little studio I had on the ship, and I'll show you anything you'd like to see. But I was speaking quite personally to some, to some sailors. You know, life on board a warship is very unforgiving, indeed. And not only is there a lot of physical uh, um, risk involved, there's a huge mental health angle. Can you imagine going to sea for, in the last year, we went to sea for eight months. We only went to, because of COVID, we only went to shore three times in that time. So the, the mental pressure on young people, particularly, is, is huge. We have to be aware of that. And it's part of the story I tell. You know, we, we don't often think enough, I think, about what we ask our young soldiers, airmen, or air, air persons, I should say, uh, and, um, and sailors, what, what that we ask them to do in, in the name of our country. Um, now, of course, one, one of the things that has been a huge privilege in, in the making and the, of the films and the writing of the book is that um, Her Majesty the Queen uh, visited the ship on many occasions. And I was there certainly for her commissioning in Portsmouth. Um, and actually, the day before we left on our last appointment, we were told we had a surprise visit that, that somebody is going to come and see us off, and it was Her Majesty. So it's pretty much her last um, military, major military engagement. She came to see um, HMS, uh, HMS Me, as she used to call it. Um, <laughs> Um, to see us off and, and bid us farewell, which is, and I captured that on film, which was a wonderful thing to have done, especially now. Um, now I'm going to just break off there. I'm going to show you the first of three clips I'm going to sh show you. Uh, the, they're they're pre what we call the pre title sequence of this series. And the first series, of the first series I said was um, biggest, Britain's biggest warship. And I think this will give you, this will encompass. Okay, so that's the um, beginning of the first series. And of course, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? The, she was fin when she was built, she was built from a, a design, but it hadn't ever been tested. How could you test it? This was the prototype and the finished, finished product all at the same time. With um, uh, mobile phones or cars, you can make hundreds of the things to get it, to get out all the you know, the, the, the problems and, 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 de and decide what the problems are. But with a war warship like this, you've only got one go. And any inherent problems, any inherent, uh, you know, demons, um, that then you have to live with it. And in fact, uh, one of the things that happened on our first sea trial, which will uh, features in this um, series, is we were in the North Sea, and we're going at full speed. We're, what what ha tended to happen, we were establishing um, what our maximum speed was, which I can't tell you because it's a state secret. Um, I do know. Um, but also, you have, to, you have to put on the brakes. You go, you go crashing into reverse to, see, to, to, to stop uh, as soon as you can. Um, but that puts huge strain on the, on the hull, huge strain, and on the drive shafts that spin the propellers. And on one occasion, everything had gone really well. But then up in the um, chart room, right up on the, near the bridge, uh, the navigator noticed that his coffee was vibrating. He said, that's unusual. 
that. That's just a sign, you know, you and I would not have noticed anything different, but there's little ripples in the coffee, and he said, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the ship. That shouldn't be happening, and he was right. Um, we had, our, our starboard drive shaft had fractured, and it could have been really dangerous if it had, if it had gone any further. If we hadn't stopped it then and there, it could have been really, really very serious indeed. It could have, it would have caught fire, the, the gear shaft, the gear box would have um, imploded, the engine would, it would have caught on fire, we could have had major casualties. Uh, we could have even have lost the ship if it had come really, really bad. And do you know, I bet some of you might have seen the series or even read the book, but the, the issue, it wasn't a, a Russian limpet mine, or we hadn't hit a whale, or we hadn't done anything more serious than we'd hit a lobster pot. Yeah, a lobster pot, and the rope of the lobster pot had wrapped itself around the drive shaft, um, and there had been a loose bolt on, the, on one of the propellers, and that was enough to shift the, the center of gravity. And that, so only one little thing can go wrong, and you've got then a major, major problem. And by the same token, the other thing I was also filming at the time was over, just over here, just you know, here. Portsmouth was going to be the Queen Elizabeth's eventual home port. So that she was so huge, she would never fit in there. They had to go and dredge uh, uh, three million tons of sand and gravel from the harbour bottom so she could get in uh, without scraping, scraping her bottom. And of course, in doing so, an awful lot of very interesting stuff was dredged up. I mean, a lot of Nelsonian artifacts, but also Second World War bombs, unexploded bombs, um, three of which we bought off just the, the coast of the Isle of Wight and detonated. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so there were so many aspects of, of the building of Queen Elizabeth that, that I was able to capture and film and, of course, write about. Now, I'll just break away from the filming a little bit and talk about the decision to write about a, a book version of the series. Um, and it was a very different experience because to, tra to translate the visual art or the, vis you know, the film into the written word is, is quite tricky. Um, and w what I was faced with initially was, do I write this as I've done previous books in the first person so, like, in the I, I was there, I am there, I'm telling you my story, Chris Terrell's story, um, which I did with my, my books on the Royal Marines in Afghanistan, or do I write in the third person? Now, I decided in the end to write in the third person, as you, some of you might have seen. Um, I don't know whether that was necessarily the right decision. It's, I made that decision, I'll stick with it, but, but it... So it made it perhaps a little less personal than it might have been had it been my story. But I didn't want it to be my story. I wanted it to be the story of these remarkable young people, these young men and women who, 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 who do their duty for our, for our country. And, you know, the youth gets a bad press, sometimes for reason, but often not. And so it's my privilege to um, bring to the nation's attention the remarkable young people that we do have. Um, not only in the military, of course, but my interest is in the military. So I've written the book in the third person. Now that does give me one huge advantage. It means that I can become the all-seeing eye. I can be wherever I want. I'm not restricted to where Chris Terrell is. So I can expand and I can write it almost as a novel. So it is a sort of real life novel. That's the way I've written it. And I've drawn on, um, you know, it's a huge, huge joy to write. It gave me freedoms that I don't get as a filmmaker often. Um, so, so, and the, um, so the, the, the films continue to be sort of in the, interesting, sort of in the first person and third person at the same time. As a filmmaker, very often you decide you're going to make it very much as a, um, a distinct observer. You stand back, what the camera sees, it's almost like you're filming through a, a, a glass wall, an invisible glass wall. And there's, so you're, you're pretending the camera isn't there. That's a lot of documentaries you might have watched, it'll look like that. I don't do it that way. 
I think that you have to be honest and open and the camera, the camera has an effect on behavior and it's part of the story. So I break, the, I break that fourth wall, if you like. And so if you watch my films, you'll, you'll hear me. I'm not a character, it doesn't matter who I am, but the camera becomes a character. So the camera actually becomes the viewer. I like the camera to be, so the, the sailor, the, whoever I'm following, will interact quite intimately with the camera. He might say, talk to me as Chris, that doesn't matter who Chris is, but it's like I am you, I'm representing you. And that's the way I try to write the book as well, to make it, to try and give the reader, as, uh, as far as I can, a sense of being there, rather than just telling you objectively what it's like. So if you, if you read the book, if you have read the book, or hopefully if you will read the book, um, I think you'll find it surprisingly personal, but surprisingly intimate. Um, by the way, I was going to say, I meant to say at the start, I will be having questions at the end, but I'm very happy if there's any spontaneous questions as I'm talking, to stick your hand up or get a microphone over to you. So I don't mind doing that way at all. Um, okay, I'm just going to now break off and show the pre-title sequence of the second series, and then right at the end I'll show you as I say, you're the first people to will see the new pre-title sequence of the new series that's coming out at Christmas, or just after Christmas. So, um, we had finished the uh, construction, we'd finished the sea trials. The next thing was to take the ship over to America, her first major voyage, her maiden voyage, over to America to test the F-35B Lightning stealth fighter, the state-of-the-art um, jet fighter that is uh, built by, jointly by mostly the US, but also we, we had a, a big stake in it, it was a US-UK project. Um, arguably the most lethal fighter jet in the, in the world. Um, but nobody had tested it. Nobody actually knew whether it would land, it's, it's a hover, hover landing, the B variant of the stealth fight of the F-35. But we didn't know whether it, it would the, the immense thrust from its rocket, almost like its rocket thrust, when it's coming down, would burn a hole through the deck. We didn't know. Um, so it was quite exciting for that first landing to happen. So we went to America to do that. So this is um, the pre titled sequence for that series. Does that work? So you see, th things are, s are ramping up the, from the, you imagine, how I felt actually, very personal, very, very, uh, very emotional void for the journey for me because I saw the laying of the first steel by the Princess Royal in Govan in 2009, seen her being put together like that Lego toy I described, seeing her going to sea for the first time, trial for the first time, and then crossing the Atlantic for the first time, having helicopters and jets landing for the first time. Um, and just at the time that, of course, the world was beginning to face serious political disarray, leading to where we are today. I'll talk a bit about that um, later, later on. Um, but it's interesting. Filming is, is great, and it gives you um, a passport into people's living rooms. I can bring my stories you know, in, into your front room for you to watch. But films by their, their very nature, they're only an hour long, and that, that's quite a long film, an hour. Um, even a, BB, a BBC hour is pretty much an hour. An ITV hour or a commercial hour is only about 45 minutes because advert breaks. So it gives me quite limited time to give you the story I want to tell you, and I'm bursting to tell I mean, I come back, you ask my wife, I come back bursting with these stories. I'm so eager to tell them, but then I have to compress them, compress them, compress them. So I, my first cut of a film is two hours, maybe three hours long. And I went, ah, that's fine, I want, I want to put that out, but the BBC won't let me do that. I've got to get it down to 59 minutes dead. Um, and it hurts, because I've got to cut, 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 cut. The wonderful thing about a book is, I don't have that, I, I did actually, my manuscript was immensely long, I have to admit. But nonetheless, I've got 100,000 words plus to play with, and you can get an awful lot more in a book than you can in a film. So I could, I could spread my wings. I could take you much more 
intimately, much more deeply into the stories and into the characters in particular. Whether it be Jerry Kidd or Bob Hawkins, the first lieutenant, or, or Wes Calm, the wonderful chef there, and many other extraordinary characters. The, 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 milit the military in general, I know, Karen, you'd agree, is full of characters. Uh, and I'd say, arguably, the, the Navy, because they have to s s live and survive together for so long at sea, they need wit and humour to get by. Uh, it's not often you get arguments. You get the occasional punch out because that's what young men in particular do. Uh, but they'll go and have a beer together afterwards. Generally, they're very shoulder to shoulder. And I love that about the Navy. Um, and I try and capture that because it's all, in the end, translated into duty and action. And remember that whilst you know, we were testing the ship that she could sail and shouldn't sink. We were testing her guns and testing her flight decks so that the F-35, the most lethal jet ever designed, could fly. And if necessary, deliver that lethality to an enemy. Hasn't happened yet, but goodness knows the, world, the way the world is at the moment, who knows whether we are going to be drawn into conflict. Um, we very nearly were in the Eastern Mediterranean last year, and I'll talk a bit about that in a, in a minute. Um, but yes, so in, the, in a book, it's, I mean, I've, I've written four books, um, so I can just about call myself an author, although really I'm a filmmaker who pretends to be an author occasionally. Um, but it, it gives me wonderful freedom to, to express myself and to tell the story I really want to tell. And I suspect that in the future, in the future years, I shall do more writing than filmmaking. Uh, I think it's where my heart is. Uh, and uh, writing these books about, this book about HMS Queen Elizabeth has, has really uh, you know, fired me up from that point of view. Um, now, it's quite interesting also that, that the, my responsibility to my subjects is the same whether it be in film or the written world, written word. I am telling very personal stories. Um, and I have to have the agreement of the, pe the young people or whoever I'm filming or writing about. I have to have their um, agreement, of course. I can't just go willy-nilly into, into, into intimate storylines without, without that. And it's where the trust comes from. As an anthropologist working, embedding and becoming as one with the community, I develop a mutual trust. It's a two-way trust. Uh, uh, and I won't ever betray that trust. So any, anything I film, uh, which is um, maybe overly intimate in terms of portraying uh, a, a, a vulnerability, an, an emotional, mental vulnerability or whatever, I will always ask permission. And, I, and I've never really had anybody um, say, no, I don't want that to be in. Usually there, there might be some sensitivity. Same with the book. So I will say to whoever it might involve, look, I know you think this is going to be too intimate, to revealing of something deep within you or some, some, personal, some pr personal privacy. Come and watch the film, see it in context. And I would say nine and a half times out of 10, it's fine. They'll see it in context and know that I've used it in, in a very um, sensitive way. And same with the book. There were some very intimate moments in the book which I, had, I wrote and sent to the people that it involved to make sure they were happy. Uh, and I think that's a responsibility that um, perhaps the general public don't know that we take so seriously, both in the filmmaking world uh, and, of course, in, in writing as well. Because it's, um, it's only then that I can really give, a, give you a, a real idea of what it's like to, as I say, that's what I want to do. I want you to see the films or read the book and feel I'm there. I, can, I feel like I, I need to take you into that extraordinary world. And when I say extraordinary world, it's the one what I try to portray both on the page and in the film is just how extraordinary it is. It is a little Britain, 23 nationalities, as I said, very inclusive, very diverse, 24-7 uh, functioning warship. And I would say 95% of the ship's company don't see the light of day. Have you thought about that? There are no portholes, no windows. Only the flight deck crew ever get to see the sky or feel the air against their skin. 
majority of the people are working in what they call the biggest submarine in the fleet. They're, they're, um, they're existing in, a, in like troglodytes in the subterranean world. For, for, and, and actually, for, for if not days on end, weeks on end, you do get the occasional opportunity to get up there at dawn or dusk for a quick run around the flight deck. Um, and very occasionally, if you've been pushed really hard, the captain will call what's, what, what he calls a Sunday routine. Whatever day it is, he says, Sunday routine today, they might be having aircraft maintenance, so they're not flying. By the way, the reason you can't go up on deck is because of flying. It's a very dangerous place to be. The most dangerous place for anybody to work, actually. Uh, but if they're doing aircraft maintenance, then you, you are allowed out there for a barbecue or, or just a, a sports day or something. But that might happen once in every two months. Um, so it's, it's, that's, again, a, a world I have to try and try to paint, either with my filming or in words, um, to, to, to portray what is. Even a modern warship is uh, a very unforgiving place to be. Um, so it's, uh, and 1,600 people, I mean, I, even though I'm on the, that ship, I, when I go to sea, I'm on her for anywhere between three to eight months. I think the first time I was on her for three months, the second time for four months, and last time for eight months. So the consequence of that, of course, is that I'm the only person probably that served on the on HMS Queen Elizabeth on all her deployments since being built. So I, I do know her like the back of my hand. And uh, so anybody, any newcomers need to know the way around. They always say, ask Chris, he knows. So he's usually able to, to, to um, I, I at least some use. Um, but it's, it's also, it's not just about fighting. It's not just about ready to take on the, the foe, about launching F-35s into, as we did, into S Syria on the last trip to, in support of ground forces, rooting out the remnants of ISIS terrorist groups or dealing with the Russians who are giving us a really hard time, or dealing with the Chinese giving us a hard time as well. Um, but it's just existing on a day-to-day -day basis. People eat. There are, you know, some of the most important people on that ship are the, are the galley staff, the chefs, who are catering not only for hungry young men and women, but all sorts of diets. I'm a vegan. They w cooked wonderful food for vegans. There were a lot of us, a lot of vegans on board. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people have different sorts of diets according to religious uh, beliefs. So all of this is carrying on, and it, it, it is, as I said before, Little Britain. There's a, there's a coffee shop. There's a, a grocery store. It's, it is like they, sailors call their ships uh, grey villages. Well, HMS Queen Elizabeth is more like a grey city, really. It's so big. But it is uh, a 24-7, cosmopolitan, diverse um, community. Um, again, uh, th this is, it was my job to translate this into the, not only from film in, into the written word, and it was much more liberating to be able to write. Uh, it, it, and I hope that if you do, if you do, um, if you do read the book, uh, I hope that comes out and that you do at least finish it, uh, feel that you've, you've sensed the character of the ship and the character of the sailors. Um, so it came to the third. Now, the book encapsulates the building of the ship from, from the word go, from building the, laying down the first deal all the way to being commissioned by the Queen. Um, and, and, and there it stopped. But then we, then we had to wait nine months for first operational deployment. And nothing was going to stop me going on that deployment. Um, a lot of, by this time, she had become such an iconic uh, sort of a symbol of nationhood, if you like, that a lot of other film companies were bidding for the opportunity to, to tell the story of the first operational deployment. So we had, we had to just join the queue, or not join the queue, but compete for the commission. And um, I'm very thankful that we won it. And I have to say that Jerry Kidd was instrumental in that, but I had his trust. And so I went um, May, May of last year uh, and embarked on what turned out to be an extraordinary eight months, which um, I'll be telling in the new series. 
uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be committing to paper as well to, to, to the, 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 an even more intimate insight into that first deployment. Um, it was always going to be exciting because of Russia and China. We were heading for the, the South China Sea. And of course, with the situation there with China and Taiwan, we knew that was going to be tricky. But the whole purpose of sailing our biggest ever warship, accompanied by her escorts, she had nine escorts, including a nuclear submarine. You, you don't sail a, a warship anywhere without it being protected. It's a big target. So it needs destroyers and frigates and submarines to look after her, both from subsurface threat, surface threat, and aerial threat. So, and we were locked and loaded and ready for anything. And we didn't know, we, we, weren't, we weren't going to war as such, but it was a tricky old world we were sailing into. Um, and when we got to the Eastern Mediterranean, um, the Russians, whilst we were flying jets into Syria uh, on counter um, terrorist operations, of course, Syria's closest ally is Russia. And we knew we would ex be expecting some issues from the Russians, but not what we got. They were coming at us in every direction. Um, not attacking, but trying to make life difficult for us. Low flying, um, pushing us, cajoling us, trying to bully us. Um, that's the nature of naval warfare up until the point somebody presses the button and starts firing things. It's all about what's called the constructive kill. You lock on to your enemy. You show them you locked onto them first before they locked onto you. So you're saying, right, you, you can tell by computer whether you're locked onto or not. If you're locked onto, you're dead. Submarines take what call, what's called perifots. Those are photographs through the periscope. If you can photograph a ship, you can shoot it, you can torpedo it. They were trying to perifot us. We were sending out our anti-submarine uh, warfare helicopters, Berlin helicopters, to find the submarines before they could perifot us. In every case, we found them first. In every case, the, F the, the MiGs, the Russian MiGs, and flankers, as they're called, bomber fighters, fighter bombers, were trying to overfly us to show that they could with impunity. But every time, the F-35s, the, um, the, the fleet air arm and RAF pilots, and the US Marine pilots we had as well on board, got out there and intercepted them at range, and they didn't come near us. It's interesting, isn't it? We look at what's happening in Ukraine today, and Russia's not getting its own way by any means, is it? Well, the Russian Navy is very wanting, and we proved that. What we didn't know then was why Russia was being so combative and, and, and really trying to prove a point over us. It didn't, but we now realize in hindsight what was happening. It was building up to Ukraine. We sent one of our escorts, HMS Defender, away from the task group when we were stationed in the, in the, just off the Syrian coast. We sent Defender up to the Black Sea, very provocatively, I have to say, um, to sail within the territorial waters of the, of the Crimea. Because in terms of international law, those are international waters. It's only according to Russian law that they're Russian waters. So we sailed. HMS Defender sailed through what Russia insisted with its own waters and actually fired, claimed to have fired on us and bomb us. They didn't actually, they just claimed that. They got that story out very quickly, but it was all lies. But it, the information war is all, 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 also part of the story. Um, you, you, again, we see that in Ukraine. But then, so you've got that going on. And this is what I'm making the film about and will write about eventually, is what was going on below the decks. And that was even more sinister because when we left Great Britain, um, we had bubbled so that we were completely COVID free. We had to be. We had double jabs in those days. It was just double jabs. But and we had bubbled for weeks so that uh, nobody um, was infected. And it stayed that way. We stopped in Sicily for a run ashore, pretty careful mask. We stopped in Cyprus, run ashore. Um, but then when we got to the bottom of the Red Sea, we had the first infection identified. By the time we got into the China Sea, sorry, the Indian Ocean, we had 600 in isolation. Yeah, and this is a story I'll be telling uh, in due course. 
And that was, so you add the pressure of subterranean living on a warship, add COVID into that equation. And isolation isn't like we had to practice it. You just have to stay at home. These were eight man cabins, eight men in a cab, single cabin, having to isolate for up to 30 days. That's a big ask. Um, and there were, it's coming out of the film, so I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you this much, that there were three attempted suicides, one successful. These are the pressures that our young people are being put under. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's I'm not a criticism, I'm just pointing out that um, whilst most of these young men and women are living the dream, as they say, um, they're also being put under huge sorts of pressure. COVID was unexpected, when nobody knew that that was going to happen. Um, so I'm going to show you now the, a little insight into the new series. Um, never been seen by anybody before, and this is, this is a, a very rough cut. So uh, Caroline Katz, who did the VO, the voiceover for the first two series, isn't on this. She will get her in later, later to do that. So it's my voice. It's a temporary voice. But this will give you a little insight into the new series and hopefully the new book. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of a preview there for you. Um, what, one thing I'm just going to finish by I'm going to say one more thing to you, tell you one more thing, and I'll open up to any questions if there are any. Um, on this voyage, on this last voyage, in addition to the 23 nationalities on board we had, from, drawn from Commonwealth countries, we had 300 US Marines, because we had 10 F-35s flown by US Marine pilots. So for the first time since the Second World War, certainly, we had... Uh, deployed on a British warship, a, a squadron of American uh, US Marines and, and, and airplanes. And that, that's not just a one-off, that's very indicative of what's going to come. The Navy and the US Navy and our Navy talk about interoperability, not a very nice word, but it, it, it's, it, it's the word they use. It is about working together, not just as allies, because we are allies, you know, the, the special relationship, but working together on the same ship. So we can, we, can, we can fly off and off, on and off their ships, they can fly on and off ours, and we work much more closely together as a unit. Now, what was really interesting in the South China Seas, and I, I talk about this in the book a bit, but um, you know, it, 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 I think it's a story for the future, is that because, I mean, HMS Queen Elizabeth and her escorts, which will be British Foreign Navy ships, but also we had Dutch ships, we had American ships, NATO ships worked together. So when we got to the South China Seas, we sailed on our way back with two American battle groups, a Japanese, uh, for want of a better word, battle group, um, Australian and New Zealand ships in a 40-strong fleet. And we just sailed as close as we dare to Taiwan. And that was just to show the Chinese they've got a bigger navy than we have as a country. But when you add up NATO together, we're much more than the sum of our parts, and HMS Queen Elizabeth is a fundamental part of the new NATO Navy, uh, the most advanced, the most, the most um, state-of-the-art aircraft carrier bar none, including the new American ones. The new American carriers are pretty much le legacy designs in the 70s. There's nothing like Queen Elizabeth uh, in terms of her automation, notwithstanding what's happened to the Prince of Wales, which if you want to talk about that, we can do later on. But uh, that's, uh, that's just a hiccup, that's a speed bump. Uh, so it's really interesting, I think, what's happening uh, militarily, politically, uh, and, and indeed socially, from my point of view as an anthropologist. And it's all happening on HMS Queen Elizabeth, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, um, we, we, I think we are probably overrun a bit. Have we got time for questions? Yeah. If, yeah. Can we, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Any questions, put your hand up and I'll come over to you with a microphone so everybody can hear your question. Oh, there's another microphone there. Hello. Um, you say you had complete editorial control. Um, was there any time when you were 
um, showing the Navy series as you were filming it that they winced a little bit or were reluctant that you would um, continue? Good, very good question. Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, you, you can't um, you can't you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, and, and that's very much the case with filmmaking or, or writing books, because you are the, the military mind is is a very particular sort of mind, uh, and they, they 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 like control, and I have to persuade them that that sort of control won't work for me because I have to be much more freewheeling uh, and honest, if you like. Um, I'm not making PR films for the Navy, although I would always argue that. My films and indeed my books. I've written this, this book is my third book about the Navy. Um, one other book about the commandos. Um, so yeah, yeah I'm. Uh, they are concerned about how far I go. Like in 1994, I made a series and wrote a book called HMS Brilliant, which is about the first time women went to sea. Now, for those pioneering women who, who were on board at the time. Uh, life was hell. The men didn't want them on board. They were given absolute hell, and I captured that, and I wrote about it. With, uh, and the Navy really didn't like it at all. So much so that after HMS Brilliant, I wasn't allowed anywhere near the Navy for 10 years. I'd, I, I'd, and I said at the time, you're going to thank the day I wrote that book or made that film, because it, it, it opened up the naval world, which was very masculine, very male dominated and, and uh, negated the, what the female community could add to a ship um, but there was still a lot of, a lot of um, reservation about them on board and I then I went back to um, the Navy 2004, I wanted to make another film called Shipmates, which I did and wrote another book and I went to see the PR guy in the Navy and he, they, they'd agreed that my proposal was good I was going to write a and make films about HMS Devonport and ships selling out of Devonport at the time. And he said, um, okay, well, that's great. Um, well, we don't want another HMS Brilliant, though. Have you ever seen HMS Brilliant? And I said, in all honesty, well, I had seen it, yes. I didn't tell him I made it. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, I, I joke about it, but it's serious. It's, you make a very good point. Um, and I'm not there to um, upset the Navy. I'm there to tell an honest story, though, an authentic story. I, I owe it to you, my viewers and readers, that I give you the honest story, not the PR story. But I've always argued to the Navy, my films, my books, are better PR than your PR, because you guys aren't stupid. You know what's PR, you know what's not. And if you're getting an honest, an honest what's and all story, then I think that's what you, you deserve, and it's, what, it's my duty to give it to you. And the, there's two more things to say. Of course, the Navy depend on people like me and my films and my books to help recruit youngsters like this, you know, um, young, young men and women who might want to join up. Uh, and I'm happy to say that my films do lead to a spike in recruitment for, for all the best reasons, I think. Um, but there are two issues which I am very, um, I have to be very careful of and very uh, sensitive to and I'm very understanding of, and that's what's called um, OPSEC, which is operational security. So I, what I can't do, of course, is give away national secrets. And in an operations room on a warship, there are lots of, lots of secret screens and, and radar, you know, radar um, information, which I might capture on my camera. So that has to be gone through very carefully and either cut out or blurred. If you ever see, if you see any blurring on any, any of my films, that's because there's something secret behind the blurring. Uh, but also um, per, per sec, which is personal security. Sometimes you've got to be careful about the personal security of individuals, um, either in terms of giving too much away for, for, for enemies of the state. Um, you know, for example, when, when we were in the Eastern Mediterranean or being followed by Russian spy ships, which was often the case, they would be trying to suck out information from people's mobile phones in order to compromise not only them but their families because they can suck out the information get the phone numbers of families and friends and so on um, so we went to um, um, River, River State Red which was meant that all mobile phones off uh, until you were told otherwise so the, so the personal security aspect is also very important and actually there's another issue which is really 
upsetting to me in, in that these days films and books can lead, because of social media, to overactive Facebook um, you know, entries or, or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it might be because young people live their lives through the social media and it doesn't take much to get people trolling. So you put somebody on screen in the most innocent capacity uh, and they, you know, we've got to be very careful and wary uh, on their behalf of possible consequences on social media. So we have a duty of care to people that we make films about or indeed I write about um, because you know, there's some nasty people out there and if you, if you do put your head above the parapet and agree to be filmed then you have the, you have the possibility that you're going to get trolled. But, um, so, so I work very closely with the Navy in these respects. It's not, it's not a locking of horns but we come to an agreement about what I can show and what I can't show. You saw there a glimpse of the F-35 we lost in the Mediterranean. Well, that's taken a lot of negotiation. Should I show it or should I not show it? And I think they were very sensible in the end. I wanted to show it, of course, and it becomes a major part of the last film uh, um, because we all know it happened. It was it's been publicised. We all know we lost a jet. And it, it, these things happen. These things happen. Let's be open and honest about it. That's always my argument. Let's be open and honest and not try and conceal stuff. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Excellent question. Wait, could, hold on. Did everybody hear that question? No. Okay. Could you please repeat the question in a microphone or, Chris, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. Okay. I'll, I'll repeat it for you. Yeah. So the, the, the lady asked how far down, when the planes land or take off for launch, launch recover, as they say, how far down can you hear it or feel it? Um, well, there's two ways of answering that question. The, first of all, uh, I'd say you can hear it all the way down to eight deck, and there are nine decks, so all the way down below the water line. Two deck, which is immediately below the flight deck, um, that's where they have the Haven coffee shop when people go for peace and quiet. Well, you don't get peace and quiet when there's an F-35 landing, believe me. The rattle, everything rattles. And you think it's coming through the, the deck. Uh, so when, when, it's not so much, it's not so bad when they're launching, but when they're landing, that's when you really do hear it. And your bones rattle. And you can't talk to, they're probably talking, you can't hear anything. But the other thing to say about that is that an F-35, a jet fighter, fully fueled and armed, is a flying bomb. And if that comes down too heavily or, cr or indeed crash lands, that could go through the deck. And that could, be lead to, you, you could, you could lead to a major loss of life and, of course, maybe even the loss of the ship. The first thing that we tried when we launched the, put the ship into water up in Ross Ice, it wasn't the propellers, it wasn't the, the drive shafts, it wasn't, it wasn't the water plants, it was the... Um, it was the chutes that come out if you have to abandon ship. So the first thing they tested was, can we get off this ship if it sinks? And that's even before we went to sea to make sure that she could float. Um, so, yeah, it's all about safety. But So I, I just add that uh, in partial answer to your question. But you, you always... And the thing is, at night, when they were, we were taking off and landing all through the night during the operation in Syria, and so you don't get much sleep. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Um, my son has uh, been on QE since uh, crewing up and has just come off to do his petty officer's course at uh, Bollingwood. And uh, obviously been around the ship about four different times yeah. and went to the uh, commissioning. But I was quite amazed how much room, um, there's a, a, a whole deck area, uh, almost as big as this sort of area here, which was... Um, a, turned into a gym because they didn't need the um, trap. the, the uh, catapults when yeah. you put the angle deck in, yeah. which I thought was amazing. Must, must have been a, a last-minute yeah. thing. Yeah, that's a very interesting point as well. And, and indeed, that's why there's a, one huge gym, as you say, a very large expanse, and also the Haven Coffee Shop, which it wasn't, you know, they didn't build a coffee shop into the designs of a warship. 
it, it is because they, desi they decided eventually that it wouldn't be a cat and trap ship. That means it wouldn't have a catapult system to launch um, aircraft uh, in the conventional way, but it would have, uh, you know, ho hover to, to planes that ho hovered, could launch off the, off the ski jump, as we call it, and hover on. But it still has the ability, the capacity to become a cat and trap ship if we decide, which we might well do, to have conventional aircraft. Because the F-35B, which is the variant we are flying, is just one of three variants. And there's an A and a B, and one of them is a has to fly conventionally, both off and land on, which means it has to be caught by a, by a uh, straining wire. And if that happens, the boys and girls are going to lose their gym and their coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs>